بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم um, Excellencies, ladies and gentlemen, it gives me a great pleasure, I didn't realize I was the first uh, lecturer of the series, um, to be here today and I'm extremely delighted with the presence of all of you and my sincere thanks to, to your excellency for s supporting um, the, the institute itself and the community through these lectures. Um, there are a lot of different things that we can talk about about the UAE, but there's one area that I feel, um, and this is only through my experience coming in um, to this particular ministry, um, whereby the, the MDGs themselves are actually very crucial um, for the existence of the world. And so the, the idea of, or the concept of this lecture today is not to talk about the MDGs and the commitment of UAE to itself to actually deliver or to uh, commit itself of milestones through the MDGs because U UAE is actually one of the most advanced countries when it comes to commitment uh, for itself for, for the MDGs and we'll talk about what the MDGs are. However, um, the interest is really more related or relevant to the role and responsibility of the United Arab Emirates toward its partners in other countries of the world. And what, what, what better way of delivering their foreign aid and their policies uh, but through this particular uh, mandate or approach that's been um, uh, uh, coming out of the United Nations with consensus from all countries throughout the world uh, about this. Um, so why, why would I talk about the MDGs? We, we are responsible as, the, as a ministry to look at foreign, our foreign policy and what it means of criteria and priorities of foreign aid um, toward other countries from, from the UAE perspective. Um, in this, some growth figures, greater access to knowledge, better nutrition and health services, more secure livelihood, secure security against crime and physical violence. And you can read the rest. This is pretty much the beginning of the MDGs. It is Mahbub al-Haq, who was the founder of the Human Development Report. It's interesting to see that there are two, two men actually has been instrumental in the MDGs. Um, uh, Dr. Mahbub al-Haq is someone who looked at um, the human development in, in his principle is a simple premise that people are the real wealth of nation. We always consider uh, measuring countries by, by their wealth, by the growth of economies, but the real best to goods and services. But be, besides that, um, it also looks at expanding people's power to select leaders, influence public decisions, and share knowledge. So uh, it, it, the core of this is the human life. Um, all of us work toward this particular goal, and the Human Development Report actually ranks countries based on how much commitment they have to this. So the, my talk today is really about what the United Arab Emirates had done for other countries in helping out achieve their MDGs and improving their well-being. Um, how is it measured? There are uh, um, basically a, a, a human development index that was established in 1990 by Mahbub al-Haq, the uh, Pakistani uh, economist, and the Indian economist, economist uh, Amartya Sen. Um, and that was the first human development index. And this is a composite of statistics of life expectancy, education, income indices used to rank the countries in four tiers. Um, what I'd like to talk about is next is the actual Millennium Development Goal, what they are. They are a set of strategic um, tasks uh, to rid the world of concrete examples of how to scale up the success and accomplish the eight Millennium Development Goals by 2015. But what's more interesting is what is beyond 2015. So the Millennium Development Goal MDGs are to eradicate extreme poverty and hunger, to achieve universal primary education, so poverty and education, or what we call as the lowest level of Maslow's law. These are human needs that are, require a lot of attention. Promote gender equality, empower women, reduce child mortality, improve maternal health, 
combat HIV, AIDS, malaria, and any other disease like today we're talking about Ebola, to ensure environmental sustainability and develop a global partnership uh, uh, development. Within these, um, the UAE has committed in helping other countries to achieve this through the delivery of foreign aid. Um, the delivery of this humanity, the, uh, the aid in the form of, uh, the UAE delivers foreign aid in the form of humanitarian development assistance. If I record uh, our reporting in 2012, and I'll go through the number of then Mustar itself, and the Institute, I have seen through um, extremely very important projects that's been actually stemmed with the leadership of His Excellency Sultan Jaber, um, delivering development projects related to access to energy. No one can do anything. You cannot have um, supply of uh, food or uh, water, uh, good water, or develop any projects or any type of infrastructure if you don't have access to energy. And a lot of these countries, uh, poor countries, sometimes access to energy is the biggest challenging um, area. And um, Mustar had delivered primarily to particular islands in uh, turbine, uh, Wind, uh, uh, wind turbine, uh, as uh, um, uh, humanitarian aid, we've done a joint education program in Rajib camp. We've done with the Norwegian res rescue um, uh, entity as well, with projects and vocational training for refugees, uh, Syrian refugees as well. And we move on to do more, much more projects with partners. It means that we can both deliver better and um, uh, more efficient uh, projects uh, for, for these countries. Let's move on to talk about uh, how much support of foreign aid has UAE achieved uh, or delivered between 2011 and 2000. I can go on for numbers before, but I think it is very crucial to look at 2011, 2013. From the numbers here, um, in terms of uh, billions of UAE dirhams, 2011, it was 3.2, and then increased in 2012 to 4.2, and then it moved on to a, a, a huge number of 20.48 billion uh, dirhams. Um, this came out, of course, because a lot of crises in the Middle East had stemmed and um, had started to create a lot of conflicts and, and need uh, in, this, in this particular challenging time, 2013. In addition to more demand has come through certain continents. Now let's look about where this money got dispersed in these particular projects. Um, the contribution of money that goes toward this comes from several aspects. The major bulk comes from the government itself, Zeki, is that moving? Um, the government gives the highest percentage, and we do this in collaboration between us. We have a committee mandated by the, prime, the cabinet to work together with the NGOs, top NGOs that we have, um, in addition to um, other ministries as well, uh, including Ministry of Foreign Affairs and some others as well. But within this, we see that the, um, beside the government, uh, Abu Dhabi Development Fund, uh, Abu Dhabi Fund for Development, and, the, and they deliver uh, long, uh, long term and short term um, scale projects. Uh, Red Crescent, uh, uh, Khalifa bin Zayed Al Nahyan Foundation, and Red Crescent, they work in um, uh, crises, but also in delivering some of the projects and, and building up hospitals and others. Uh, Abu Dhabi Future Energy, Mustar, 0.22%, and that reflects in the environment support. It took a while for us to, to get the numbers uh, probably, and we've been actually um, enhancing these reports uh, moving forward. The other one is the humanitarian aid and emergency response through the United Nations Financial Tracking Service, the FTS. Sometimes these numbers get announced um, through um, the United Nations organizations in terms of aid, so you'll see these reports reported on their website. But all these numbers for us, you can see them on uh, MECAD or my ministry's uh, website, and we will give the uh, website uh, access at the end. 
um, you'll see a lot of these reports where the money has gone. And uh, so over the years from 2009, we actually have evolved to do better performance. In terms of coordination, the numbers do not come from us. They come from the top donors. They come from the public, not the public, but the uh, donor entities in addition to the governments and the local government as well, where we consolidate the numbers and then we report them to these two uh, organizations. So uh, um, commitment to accurate accessible information on foreign floors is very crucial to us. And also it gave us a lot of recognition both at the UACD level and the United Nation. Um, if we would like to, what I'd like to do is look at this reporting and what benefit we got out of this in terms of where we moved from 2009 till today. So in our itself is a great achievement for UAE and it's a highly respected recognition worldwide, especially at the United Nations. So what happened with the MDGs? We've got one year to go from the 23rd of September this year going forward. So in terms of progress, and this is what was recorded uh, in terms of the meetings of the four um, uh, meetings that we had uh, at the UN in the General Assembly. In terms of progress, um, poverty more than halved, which is good, it's good news. Access to safe drinking water. Um, uh, 40 million more children attend school, so education for children. Five million more children living, so in terms of mortality and 1.1 million people saved from malarial deaths, so in terms of health and uh, uh, infectious diseases, 8 million people treated for HIV. This is great news, but we're not there yet. This is really what had come up from the United Nations meeting. We've done a lot, but it's not enough. So what do we do from now to 2015, and what do we do <coughs> beyond 2015? The unmet targets, Mortality under five, uh, maternal mortality, the numbers are still low. A more inclusive term compared to the MDGs. Every part of the uh, Millennium Goals that has been uh, required or needed does require a comprehensive approach to it. And therefore, we are talking about uh, the commitment is formulating sustainable development goals, work of open working groups amongst, uh, on the SDGs. So you see more meetings taking place. Here in the United Arab Emirates has been several meetings led by the Ministry of Foreign Affairs with all the different entities, um, the ministries required for this, uh, and we are part of this basically to review what's required and uh, to put our agenda going forward. Um, Member state driven process was mandated by the Rayo Plus um, uh, 20 um, shared seats representing 70 member states from five UN groups. Um, the eight sessions through February 2014 covering three dimensions of sustainable development and um, the reports that come out and the, the, the session deliberates uh, of the different agendas that have taken place. So from last year till today, there's a lot of preparation of work. And I think, Sultan, you are involved in a major bulk of this uh, as your role within the United Nations. Uh, these agendas, the MDGs, looking at the challenges, why things, certain things have not been met, and how we can actually move forward by bringing um, other mandates and other responsibilities going uh, uh, forward. So they are, in many ways, universal goals pursued nationally according to the Rio principle. And the time horizon, again, is looking at the 2015 to 2030. So, the goals on the uh, um, SDGs, development goals, they are um, concrete, simple form of post-2015 development agenda, so building on the MDGs, con um, uh, concentrate and galvanize action, provide for new commitment periods, coming decades, new global partner partnership, voluntary commitment and innovative finance, broader people and planet goals, bolder targets, more national differentiation, and uh, the SDGs draw on input. So all of us are mandated as countries, civil society and other partners to deliver, to really put a, a better uh, agenda with clarity and a partnership going forward. With this, I will conclude my talk about the MDGs. And, uh, and many congratulations to the UAE on the 
extraordinary way in which they have so swiftly grown um, a major international development uh, program. Uh, the UK is very happy to be working with the UAE uh, in a number of places, including Jordan, which you mentioned. Um, and we ourselves, of course, are also very proud of the fact that we have stuck by our commitment to the 0.7% of GNI target uh, and have met it. Um, uh, you talked about the, the post-2015 agenda and the sustainable development goals, and I saw that process beginning in New York in my last job, and I must say it's a very impressive process of consultation among all member states, but also very challenging precisely because uh, it is so broad. ...and the effectiveness of our projects. So one of the things that, um, um, that's been talked about and discussed a lot in a lot of meetings amongst the global partners countries uh, is um, driving a lot of awareness and training commitment from the recipient country. It is very important. Um, if you are there, even as a, any person, if you're there to deliver any projects, you want to see that project um, through. You want to see delivery. You want to see impact on people. Otherwise, it would be very difficult and challenging. So um, governance and uh, uh, exercising rule of the law is very, very important in some of these deliveries. There are crises in certain countries. And within these, it makes it very difficult for these projects actually to be delivered. Sometimes it goes for a couple of years, and then it stops, or it takes longer than expected. One other um, aspect, I think, security. Some of the countries, I think security is, is an aspect that's very, very important for any country donor who wants to deliver projects. So in, the, in, in this particular area, um, this is a discussion that takes place at the United Nations level. It takes place at any partners, global partners, who would meet on a reconstruction of particular countries. We, we deal with everyone. I think it all depends on the particular project, but in, in the overarching uh, arching, uh, focus of the, uh, the uh, MDGs and beyond, we have commitment through the United Nations with a lot of countries as partners. If you see the lot of pledge of money that has come uh, through the global partners. However, um, a lot of this comes through criteria and areas of the United Nations organization. So it's not, it's not just a project by itself where countries work. Uh, this is a mandate and a drive um, that had come, and the advocacy of this had come from the United Nations. So at the end of the day, we get back to the United Nations, we report, we evaluate, we have consensus on things, we dialogue with partners, but we definitely talk. Um, a group of girls from Zaid University who went to Mrejib camp in Jordan and, and actually uh, helped make a lot of kids happy there. And I've seen... Um, very emotional video about this and pictures, but the the return or the feedback that I got from the girls that this is one aspect that they felt that was very important to them. Um, they've seen something that's not part of their curriculum, but they believe that UA is a great giver. But giving them an opportunity to contribute to do something like this. Um, in addition to this, if you look at Emirates Foundation. Emirates Foundation for Philanthropy uh, had embarked on a, a big project in Takata and others were building up on vo volunteer community, whether it's here or abroad. Um, I know of Habitat programs that actually been embarking on these pro programs of volunteer and philanthropy and helping out. Okay. Yes. Uh, first of all, I'm very happy to be here. Uh, my name is Fatma Ramethi. I am uh, uh, UAE student, uh, political science student, international student. Um, I work in your uh, ministry in the summer. I learn more about. <laughs> <laughs> I learn more about the donor, a donor. I uh, make uh, research. Uh, I learn actually more information about them, and uh, I connect with the, this donor uh, to be volunteer in the next summer. So I want to be with me to go and uh, learn more about it. Well, let's get more girls to come and take a to recovery and development continuum. If you could give us some thoughts on this. Experiment. Sure. Um, it may appear to a lot of people sometimes that there are two different departments with a thick wall like China wall, and it isn't. Um, and it, the, probably the best practice that I have seen is in the ministry itself. Um, there is a, a combined team between um, humanitarian aid that sits with the 
Under Secretary um, uh, Assistant uh, Sultan and uh, Najla uh, in the international, which represents a lot of the UN as well, looking at development projects and MDGs. Um, there is a combined group. Um, sometimes humanitarian aid comes as a crisis, so it's the urgency of it, and it may require us to actually respond quickly to what's being delivered. But eventually, it actually helped to get into the mode of the MDGs. Um, when I say that uh, in 2012, 83% of uh, uh, money that's been donated or contributed sits within development projects because that's really the heart of it. Um, the other is really more of an emergency um, response to hurricanes, earthquakes that come about and certain areas of poverty where uh, uh, countries probably 5,000 refugees within the, the uh, 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 the uh, camp that we have in Rajib, but this is expanding to accommodate about 8,000. But Zaatari, for example, requires more. We built hospital there, a clinic by Herhana Sheikha Jawahir, but we had programs for the kids. Um, and this, is a, a, this is an emergency environment where there are people, especially women and children, who are traumatized. The focus for us is really direct attention, immediate direct attention. We work with our partners in trying to solve some of these issues. Um, in certain areas, it's not. Um, you know, you will give money for crises, for example, whether it's a hurricane or a, typh a typhoon or something. But after a while, you're back there for development projects and reconstruction of these countries. Now, a little bit uh, uh, elaborate on this. And uh, uh, my question is, uh, do you assume certain role in the recent United Nations resolution where you can use the borders even from the north where not really under the Syrian regime? Yeah. So thank you very much. Thank you. Um, the first pledge that came from the United Arab Emirates was the 300 million US dollars in the first conference in Kuwait. Um, this money was pre pretty much focused on the delivery of the military hospital that we have. And, there are, and they work uh, in coordination with uh, eight to nine public-private hospitals uh, within Jordan itself, from the Sa'atari part as well as inside Amman. And this work is uh, more focused of using, um, and they actually serve a lot around them uh, with the Jordanians. So this is one area um, um, that is actually moving forward. We are expanding by uh, bringing and delivering a lot of uh, porto cabins again to expand it to accommodate about 8,000 inside the, uh, within this camp. But also they've given out uh, a lot of these uh, camps, uh, within the camps, a lot of porta cabins to some of the United Nations, I think uh, in Zaatari, they've delivered some of these. They've given some to Zarqa, which is a new um, camp that's coming up now. So this is an ongoing. The $60 million uh, that came about uh, was pretty much focused on inside Syria. First priority is food, um, health projects as well. We've done this, WFP is a leading, UNRWA, by the way, is another one. Call for his last question, yes please. <laughs> People would be happy after your question. Assalamu <laughs> alaikum. Oh, one more here. Uh, me. Okay. Oh, sorry, did I interrupt someone else? Okay, uh, quick question, quickly. Um, uh. Okay, I'm Maythal Marashi, I work in Baruj. I just have one question for you. Um, We've spoken about the involvement of university children and above in, in terms of how they volunteer. My question is, are we doing anything in terms of the younger kids, the ones in school who in 2020, 2030 will be in their 20s and early 30s even? Um, are we involving them or raising the awareness of the MDGs, the SDGs in that level, the school curriculum level. I think this is a question for the <laughs> Ministry of Education and the schools, but I'd rather have them uh, focus on their math and science at the moment. I want them to be bright students coming to Zaid University and other universities. <laughs> they'll, get the, they'll get to there. Thank I, you. I think it's more, I am sure there are certain projects, so talk about uh, um, conservation projects on animals and other endangered... Coordinator, I mean environment coordinator. It was indeed a very useful session. Thank you very much, Excellency. Thank you. This is great testimony for Masdar and for Zaid Price and all the endeavor and the work by His Excellency Sultan al-Jabr. So we should salute him. <laughs> I, uh, 
I, I have to finish by saying that in, before the Her Excellency's speech, I had a brief discussion with him, with her, and I mentioned that we do have engineers without borders in Mazdar Institute. She made an excellent suggestion, Dr. Sultan. Mazdar Institute without border. So, <laughs> so we really are going to follow your advice, and let me thank you wholeheartedly. <laughs> let me thank you wholeheartedly.